The art of designing hydrostatic pumps and motors is to create narrow gaps in moving ceiling areas without creating high friction losses. It is about tribology, the science and engineering of interacting surfaces being in relative motion. One of the most important concepts in tribology is the so-called Stryber curve. Here you see such a Stryber curve. This is a measurement in our lab of a conventional slip or dive pump. The curve shows the strong increase of friction when the rotational speed of the pump is reduced. Now this is the same measurement, but now performed on one of our floating cap pumps. Both pumps have about the same displacement and are measured at the same conditions. Yet the floating cap pump reduces the friction at high speeds with about 35%. The most remarkable difference is the disappearance of the high friction forces and losses at low speeds. The mixed lubrication and the boundary lubrication have almost completely disappeared. Now, these measurements are performed at a pump pressure of 2 in the bar. And similar results can be seen at pump pressures of 1 in the bar and 3 in the bar. But where the friction strongly increases for the slipper type unit, the friction for the floating cup pump stays almost constant at a very low level. Part of this effect is due to the floating cup principle itself, which eliminates the friction losses and friction forces between the pistons and the cylinders. But another important reason can be found in the new design of the ceiling lens of the barrel. And this is the, the topic of this presentation. It is about a new hydrostatic bearing we have designed some years ago for hydrostatic machines. A bearing which also functions when the operating speed and the rotational speed of the unit, a pump or a motor, is very, very low or even close to zero. But also a bearing which stabilizes the barrel position at high operating speeds and thereby avoiding the risk of barrel tipping and in the end of malfunction of the pump. Let's first look at the conventional design. Here we see a cross section of a barrel of a slipper type pump resting on a spore plate. The contact between the two parts, between the barrel and the spore plate, is realized in the ceiling lens. These are first of all needed to avoid high leakage from the pressurized ports to the low pressure pump case. But they are also needed to create a, a pressure field to balance the barrel loads. Aside from centrifugal and friction loads on the barrel, the most dominant force is created by the pump pressure itself in the cylinders. The actual force of this pressure field needs to be compensated by another pressure field or hydrostatic force. Otherwise, it would be impossible to move the barrel and rotate it on its spark plate just because of the high friction you get. This counteracting force is coming for a part from the barrel ports itself. But the ceiling lens also create a substantial hydrostatic force in addition to the barrel ports. The ceiling lens might be narrow, but they are quite long and can have and do have a crucial effect on the total balancing the forces of the, uh, the barrel. Now the problem in this design is that we don't know exactly how the pressure drop in the ceiling lens look like, what the pressure profile is. It can be linear, when the gap height is assumed to be constant and the viscosity doesn't change, but in reality we know that the oil heats up when passing from the barrel port to the pump case. As a consequence, the oil viscosity will be changed as well. It's far from constant. Furthermore, the, uh, the pressure drop from the high pressure in the port to the low pressure in the, case, in the case will also have an effect on the viscosity and hence also on the pressure profile. And then we have elastic deformation of the barrel and also of the pour plate, including of the barrel ceiling lens. We have thermal deformation as a result, the, uh, the ceiling lens areas of the barrel and the power plates 
they won't be parallel. In addition, these production, there we have production tolerances and we have wear, which also influences the, the shape of the gap profile. As a result, the pressure field in the gap can become convex, as is shown in this drawing. This could create such a large additional force that the barrel will be lifted or tilted from the pore plate and the pump would start stop working in a proper way. But the pressure profile can also become concave, in which case the barrel will be pushed with a large force towards the pore plate. Well, as soon as we have some rotational movement, some speed, especially at higher speeds, the, the hydrodynamic effects will help to lift the barrel again and create some kind of oil fin. But as soon as the rotational speed drops again, the friction forces will go up as well. But there is a solution, a solution which we applied for some years already in our flutter cut machines. Here you see quite an ordinary pore plate and of course a different barrel. The shiny surface at the bottom of the barrel is a new ceiling land or bearing design that we applied in this pump. Let's have a closer look at this design. Here you can see a picture of one of the barrel ports. It's surrounded by ceiling lands. On the outer diameter of this port we have only one ceiling land like in conventional designs. But the ceiling land on the inner side, on the inner diameter, is split into two areas um, by a recess, area, a recess area, which we call a pocket. But the most important design feature in this new design is a small groove, which connects the barrel port towards the pocket. This groove is needed to create pressure in the pocket which will then become dependent on the gap height itself. We know that these grooves need to be small. In this design, the groove has a width of about 150 micron and a depth of about 70, 75 micron. But we don't know how exactly, how exactly, how small these grooves should be and what the effects of these groove sizes are on the, uh, the losses of the pump. So we decided to start a new pro a project, an experimental project. We wanted to learn about the effects of the group dimensions on the volumetric losses, on the torque losses, and on the overall efficiency of the pump. Not just in one operating point, but in many operating points. In the end, we averaged the losses in all these operating points and we measured the average power loss of the pump. Before I show you the results, I need to explain the experimental procedure of this project. The first step is lapping of the ceiling lens of the barrel. By lapping we can control the width and the depth of the groove, and therefore the flow area and the flow resistance of the groove. We start with a large size of the grooves, and then reduce the groove size step by step by means of lapping. Each lapping step takes away about 5 to 10 micron of the surface. After each lapping procedure, we have measured the exact precise dimensions of all these grooves. We have 12 grooves in each barrel, and we have two barrels, so in the end we need to measure 24 grooves in detail. Modern digital microscopes nowadays allow precise 3D measurements of design, design details like these grooves. The software of these microscopes also allows to determine the average width, the average depth and the flow area of each of these grooves. After we've done this, we assemble the pump, put it on the test bench and test the pump in a wide range of operating conditions, rotational speeds and pressures. This is needed to determine the volumetric losses and the hydromechanical losses as a result of this specific groove design that we have. Finally, finally we analyze uh, these data and we determine the, uh, all the losses uh, of, of the pump, including the average losses. And then we start another lapping procedure. We go back to square one. 
So let me show you some of the results of this work. Here you see the measured width of 24 grooves after the first slapping action. As expected, the grooves don't have the same dimensions. Especially the third groove of the first bell is deviating. In total we performed 9 rounds of lapping, of groove measurements, of performance measurements and analysis. On average the groove width has been reduced from 212 micron to about 124 micron. And with every step not only the width has been reduced but also the depth of the groove, which means that the flow area of the grooves has been reduced by a, about a factor of three uh, in, this, in this project. Now let me show you some of the effects that we have measured. First of all, the effects of the groove size on the case drain, the volumetric efficiency. A smaller groove size clearly reduces the pump leakage, especially in the first step of the lapping procedure. This is understandable. A smaller groove has a larger flow resistance which reduces the pressure in the pockets. As a result, the barrel will run closer to the pour plate and the leakage is, re is reduced. Now the second diagram on the right shows the friction of the barrel due to uh, its rotation on the pour plate. As you can see, the friction is increased due, uh, as a result of the reduction of the groove size. A smaller groove reduces the pressure in the pocket which reduces the gap height like before but then it increases the viscous friction due to the smaller gap height. But you can also see that the friction is lower at higher pump pressures and this is due to the effect that the pocket's pressure has a stronger balancing effect when the pressure level is higher. If we combine the two effects, the photometric and the hydromechanical effect, we get a clear view of the effect of the growth size on the overall efficiency. As you can see at one the bar, the overall efficiency reduces when the grooves are made smaller. But when the pressure gets higher, it becomes beneficial to reduce the groove dimensions. And these diagrams are for a rotational speed of 2000 rpm. And we performed also measurements at other rotational speeds. And calculated the average power loss. As you can see, there is a big gain in the first reductions of the groove size. However, below a width of 180 micron, the effects diminish. We also monitored the, uh, the wear of the pore plate. We didn't have any wear until the final step where we reduced the, uh, the width to an average of 124 micron. At that point, we measured some wear at one of the port plates. And this is the point where we started, we, we decided to stop our experiments because now we enter into the, uh, the mixed lubrication regime. So what have we learned? As expected, the dimensions of the groove influence the efficiency and the power losses of the pump. A smaller flow area reduces the leakage, but it also results in higher friction losses. In the end, these two effects cancel each other, as long as the grooves don't get too large. And this is good news. It means that the overall losses, on, a, on average, are not dependent very much on the precise dimensions of the groove, and that the grooves, the grooves don't need to be manufactured with a high precision. At the end of this project, we performed the final and last measurement of the performance in a much wider range of operating conditions. The results are shown here in this contour plot. We managed to increase the peak efficiency to 98% and to have an efficiency of more than 92% in most of the operating conditions. But we also managed to have no wear at the port plates and to allow the pump to rotate at high rotational speeds even at high pressures. In the end our goal is to prove that a pump can be as good as an electric generator or even as a gear transmission.